everybody. My name is Joe, Joe Franchetti, and I'm a developer advocate for Samsung Internet, which I'm sure is everybody here's favorite browser. Thank you. Um, I'm so super excited to talk to you all today. FFConf has been my favorite conference since I started front-end development six years ago. And it's such a delight to be on the stage that's held 10 absolutely amazing events. So thank you so much, Remy, for inviting me. Um, it's my absolute privilege today to talk to you about something that's really close to my heart, which is mentoring. And I've been mentoring junior developers for three years now. I'd like to share with you some of the amazing things that I've learned by teaching. So first of all, I'd like you to cast your minds back to when you started your own careers. For some of you, this might not have been very long ago. For others of you, maybe it was quite a while ago. When you started out, when you were in your first junior role, did you feel comfortable? Did you feel like you knew what you were doing every day? Did you feel like you had the support and attention that you needed? Did you wish you had someone you could ask the stupid questions to? Now, my own career as a web developer started when I realized that I'd just got a degree in a subject that I absolutely hated and needed to retrain in something else. So I taught myself HTML and CSS by mostly copying other people's code. You know, I was ripping off view source of the websites that I liked the look of. And whenever a piece of layout didn't go where I wanted it to go, or a piece of functionality didn't work the way I expected, then I got stuck. And I tended to stay stuck, because I had no idea where to look for answers. And I didn't have anyone to ask. And even if I'd known where to look or who to ask, I didn't really know what it was that I was asking. Has anyone else ever experienced this? Asking a question is kind of scary when you're already feeling unsure, when you feel like everyone else already knows the answer. I wish I had someone who, could, who I could ask the questions to without feeling stupid, someone who wouldn't judge me, who wouldn't talk down to me. I really needed a mentor, someone who could set me on the right path and you know, point me in the right direction. And that's why I got into mentoring myself. I wanted to be the person that I wished that I'd had. I didn't want anyone else entering the industry to go through the loneliness and uncertainty that I went through. But getting into mentoring, I discovered something wonderful. So I discovered that I made my own confidence better. I improved my skills. There are so many things that my students taught me that I just really want to share with you why I think you should get into mentoring and why I think mentoring is something that everybody in our industry should do. Everybody should have a mentor and everybody should be mentoring junior developers. So the first thing that I want to say to you is that mentoring is for everybody. The internet is for everybody. It's not just for the seniors, it's not just for the middleweights. Anybody can mentor. And we make being a developer more achievable for everybody else. So getting into mentoring, I discovered something absolutely wonderful. Yes, I was helping my fellow developers, and yes, I was making a positive change for the industry, but I also made this positive change for myself. I learned new things and I developed myself as much as I was helping my mentees. And mentoring has entirely changed my life. I wouldn't have my current job. I certainly wouldn't be up here talking to you if I'd not first been a mentor. And as any good mentor does, I wanted to share with you all the things that I've learned so that you can take them away and start making a difference too. So what it was, the picture was the amazing uh, scene from the Olympic opening ceremony that had this is for everyone scrolling around. Um, and yeah, what I wanted to say was that everybody can mentor. Even junior developers, you can mentor too. You can all mentor. And it's likely that you've already done some mentoring for someone at some point. When someone's asked you to explain something or asked them to teach you how to do something, you were mentoring them. And I'll admit that at first, I was reluctant to get started with mentoring when my friends in the industry told me that they were teaching juniors. Imposter syndrome kicked in, and I was certain that I'd never be any use to other developers. I mean, I'd be the first in line to tell you that I don't know everything there is to know about front-end development. But here's the thing, nobody expects you to know everything. In fact, it's the belief that it's possible to know everything that's causing so many of us to suffer from imposter syndrome in the first place. 
Admitting that you don't know something is one of the most powerful things that you can do as a mentor, and our industry needs more of us to talk about asking for help and about not knowing things. However, there's one thing that we are really good at as developers, and that's looking stuff up. <laughs> through practice, and sometimes through desperation, we're pretty good at finding the answer to a question. And teaching how to find that answer is just as important as teaching the answer itself. You teach what you do know, and you and your men mentee can work together through that which you don't. And for those of you who are concerned about being too junior to mentor, you've got experience that those who are just coming into the industry now don't have. You've been through the process. You've done the interviews and the tech tests. There's a lot that you can tell someone who's just putting their first foot on their first rung of the ladder. Not only that, but teaching someone else is an excellent way to make the things that you're learning now stick in your head. You're going to learn so many amazing things today. The speaker lineup is just phenomenal. And you know what's going to help you remember those things? Teach them to somebody else when you get home. I'm sure you've heard the saying before, but teaching a subject helps you get a better grip on that subject yourself. Teaching someone else is a great way to fill in the gaps in your own knowledge. You can't get away with being confused about something when you have a student. They're going to ask you for clarification, and you're going to have to sort out your own confusion. And then you can both learn together. By the time we've explained a, a particular topic to a handful of different students, each with their own set of problems and plans and questions, your knowledge is going to be so encyclopedic that when you next have a problem yourself, the answer is going to be at the end of your fingertips and not at the end of a Stack Overflow dive. And even if you think that you have no gaps in your knowledge, by the way, you're either a very rare genius or deluded, Coming up with ways to make a concept accessible to a beginner is going to make you consider it from new angles and explore nuances that you might otherwise have ignored. I heard a brilliant quote the other day from Claire Sudbury, who is the lead developer at ThoughtWorks, and she said that deep-held knowledge is worth nothing if it can't be communicated. If you feel like you know your subject inside out, but you can't explain it to your colleagues or to a junior developer or someone that you're managing, then that's a problem. Making your knowledge accessible is an incredibly important part of becoming a better developer and a better colleague. When we talk to team members about a problem or a solution, or even when we're writing code, we need others to understand what we mean. Practice communicating a complicated topic to a junior or a layperson is going to improve your skills of communication in general. How many times have you had to explain to a client or manager or a non-technical colleague about why a certain piece of work is going to take longer than hoped? Or maybe to your content manager that uploading a 3 meg image to the CMS is not the best idea. <laughs> it's common for developers to suffer from this thing called assumed knowledge syndrome. We use words like obviously or X technology is easy or the one that I hate the most because it's best practice. And this is incredibly alienating for junior developers, to those trying to learn, or anyone who isn't at quite the same level of understanding that you are. I've lost count of the number of times that I've attended events where the speaker has stood up and said something like, obviously, blah, 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 blah. And I've been like, uh -huh, it's not that obvious to me. <laughs> Could you explain? But I've still made the mistake of telling my students that CSS is easy. And luckily, some of them have had the confidence to correct me. It might be easy for you, but I'm still learning this stuff. When we say that something is easy, we're taking away the achievement value of, of actually learning it. Learning new things is difficult, and we should definitely recognize that you know, that is a thing. I've always been taught that when dealing with students or junior developers or anyone that you're managing, assume zero knowledge and infinite intelligence. That way, you no longer leave gaps in your expertise explanations or call subjects easy or shame people when they've not heard of something or not used it before. There's an excellent XKCD, which I'm sure many of you have seen before, which uh, explains this idea, well, the idea that I love. I want you to stop being the person who says, oh my god, I can't believe you don't know that thing, and start being the person who says, oh my god, this is so great, you're going to love this thing, let me show you. It'll make you much more pleasant to work with. We want to be people who encourage learning and questions and excitement. 
As developers, especially on the web, there are constantly new things to learn, new frameworks, new tools, and it's so easy to feel jaded about new things, to even feel anxiety around not keeping up with everything. But working with junior developers can reignite your passion for learning. Their positivity and keenness to learn new things is contagious. We should encourage asking questions and, of course, encourage looking for answers. Sharing knowledge is a huge part of being a developer, and shaming people for asking questions is one of the things that makes the tech industry so uninclusive. Not just that, but understanding that people learn in different ways and work in different ways will make us more pleasant to work with. Let people process information in the way that they need to. Some people are visual learners, some people like to write things down, some need to talk through their problems. Understanding how others and how you yourself learn is the first step to making learning more fun and less stress. So does your mentee prefer you to talk them through a problem or do they prefer to work quietly and then ask questions when needed? Find out if they prefer face-to-face -face or remote video meetings or chat. And if your mentee gets stuck, imagine how they're feeling in that moment. Think about why they're reacting in a certain way. Having empathy and understanding is such an important part of teaching and an important part of being a good developer and a good colleague. Everyone has had a bad or traumatic experience that might make them act strangely at times. Are you maybe making your colleague or your mentee feel stupid or overwhelmed or overloaded maybe? Consider slowing down if you need to and asking them how they're doing. Remember that there's no such thing as a stupid question. If your student or colleague doesn't know something, it's much better that they ask you than they spend hours struggling and worrying on their own and get nothing done. Making someone feel comfortable enough to ask questions is one step, but feeling comfortable enough to show someone else that you don't know something is another, and something that our whole industry needs to do more. The tech industry has a harmful idealization of the tech celebrity, the person who knows everything, who works and is productive constantly, who picks up new things instantly. I mean, they've written a new and popular library while you were still struggling to learn the previous one. But what we never hear about is their foibles. We don't hear about their down days or the times when they needed to ask for help. We forget that these people are specialists. They don't know everything, they just know one thing really well. Perfectionism in tech comes from our fear of not being as good as those people who are around us, from our fear that we'll make a mistake or that our work will be criticized. How many of you have left a project unfinished because you couldn't get it 100% perfect? How many of you have felt paralyzed before starting a project because you couldn't decide which way would give you the best outcome? We need to feel safe and secure to ask questions, to feel safe to have an off day, to not pick things up instantly. When people stop worrying about not knowing things, then they have a lot more mental energy available to start learning things and feel confident in their own ability. So not only can teaching improve your knowledge, but speaking about a subject to someone else will improve your confidence. Two years ago, I would have never even considered standing on stage in front of other developers, and now I do it for a job, and I love it. Not only will you have the confidence of your newly cemented knowledge, but you'll have the respect and gratitude of your mentees, and that can't help but bolster your confidence. Having a student turn to you at the end of a session and say something like, you're the reason why I wanted to learn this, or you've inspired me to make this new thing. Like, it just can't help but bolster your confidence. And hopefully that will push you to try new and more daunting things. A big part of being a mentor, in my opinion, is becoming an advocate for your mentee. I heard a lovely description from the people at Code Newbies on Twitter, and they said that they like to celebrate their students to the point of exhaustion. <laughs> You become this one-person cheer squad, celebrating their victories and encouraging them to reach higher, try new things, meet new people, apply for that job, apply for that promotion. And you help them feel like they belong in this industry, that they can make it through with hard work. A lot of people in the industry self-doubt self -doubt, to the point where they start excluding themselves and they feel like tech isn't for them. Celebrating their victories helps them to know that they're welcome and that they belong. And interestingly, these things that we're good at encouraging other people to do, we're often not good at encouraging ourselves to do. How many times have you told a friend to ask for a raise or to negotiate a better salary or to not let themselves get overworked or be underappreciated? 
and then not done those things for yourself when you're in the same position. One of the things that I found about being an advocate for other people is that you start to learn to advocate for yourself as well. After all, you can only dish out so much excellent advice before you start taking it yourself. We live in patient lives these days. Everything is available on demand. And we're told that impatience is a good thing in a programmer, that the need for instant gratification makes us more efficient, makes us strive to build faster products and better tools, but it can often also make us quite unpleasant to be around. How many of you have had a parental technical support call recently? <laughs> And did you stay calm the entire time? Now, I know I've snapped at my family a few times down the phone, and I'm the kind of Londoner who tuts when someone doesn't get through the ticket barriers fast enough. And mentoring has introduced me to this internal well of patience that I didn't know that I had. I've learned that I have an infinite amount of tolerance for someone who is trying to learn. And that patience is necessary in order to ensure that your student doesn't feel pressured to grasp an idea too quickly or too scared to ask you questions. But what I couldn't have predicted is that this has had a humanizing effect on the rest of my life. I'm much slower to anger in general, and better at dealing with frustration in a positive way. Understanding that frustration is a means to an end has improved the way I approach my own learning, whether it's a new framework, a tool, or just fixing a bug. Your blood pressure level will thank you. By meeting and working with those who are trying to break into the tech industry, especially from groups currently underrepresented in the tech industry, you can't help but increase your own cognitive diversity, which is your ability to understand more viewpoints and consider things from new angles. We don't all think or process information or see the world in the same way, and understanding this is really important to creating an inclusive working environment and creating accessible products and services. An example I'd like to share with you that really taught me, I was working with a student on a website that she was making for an organization called Sister Space. And they run meetups for women who maybe don't get to leave the house very often or don't get to hang out with other women very often. My student was adding the finishing touches to this website, including a giant purple rosette button that followed you up and down the page when you scrolled. That had a CTA on it that said, leave site and it was a link to the YouTube homepage. And I was really confused. Are you trying to make your users leave with such a giant and intrusive call to action? You know, she patiently explained to me that this was for women who might have a controlling or abusive partner. They don't want that partner to know that they've been using the site so they can quickly navigate away if the partner tries to look over their shoulder at their monitor. Now, I'd have never thought of this use case. And now that I have, I can't stop thinking about it and about how little we know about the people who use our websites. As developers, it's sometimes easy to think that nothing is more important than building the next feature or using the most up-to-date technology. And user testing and contextual research can sometimes feel like a painful pause in our productivity. But finding out who wants your product and how they might use it is just as important as how you make it. Skipping out on getting to know your audience, you could end up building things that they don't want or can't use. If you have access to your users for feedback, absolutely use it. There are too many examples of tech being built by undiverse teams that's not only unusable, but sometimes even harmful. Be it websites without a thought for accessibility, automatic hand dryers that only turn on for white hands, or seat belts that cause spinal injuries to women in crashes by not only working on your own cognitive diversity, but encouraging people from minority groups into the tech industry. We're increasing our ability to problem solve, to provide better and more valuable products and services. I'm slightly concerned that my next slide has not loaded. <laughs> that should say, mentoring doesn't have to be all about the tech. <laughs> You've got all kinds of experience that you can share with those who are coming after you, be it advice on getting a job or managing your workload, writing a good CV, giving interview practice, how to spot a toxic work environment, or even just being a buddy to attend conferences and meetups with. These are all great ways of mentoring. I've also heard of some offices implementing something called backwards mentoring, where a junior is mentoring a, a director or an executive. 
Now, if you've ever worked with sea level folks who've been on a six-figure salary in a six-bedroom mansion for so long that they can't remember what it was like to be surviving on a junior salary, and maybe working overtime for no extra pay because you're worried about keeping your job, maybe you'll understand why backwards mentoring is so important, to keep those people in touch with what it's like to be a junior so that they can provide a better workplace. And mentoring doesn't have to be only about improving your skills and learning new languages or frameworks. Making your job application process more pleasant and less stressful counts. Supporting onboarding of new colleagues and making sure that they're comfortable and happy, that counts as mentoring. Supporting your colleagues to get a promotion. Supporting your colleagues to take time off when they need to or to work how or where they need to. All of these things count. Oh dear, no slides. This one should say, there is no right journey into tech. <laughs> Come on, Wi-Fi. Um, there is no right journey into tech. The more people you mentor, the more you'll learn that everyone has different experiences. And everyone has different difficulties to surmount before they can put that first foot on the first rung of the career ladder. And for some people, that's just a simple step. And for some people, maybe they need a little bit of encouragement to take that step. But for some, even that first rung is out of reach. And it's up to us, who are already a few rungs above, to reach down and give them a hand. So now that I've hopefully convinced some of you to give mentoring a go, we should talk about how to be a good mentor <clears throat> and where you can find mentees. There are loads of meetups across the UK and in fact the whole world for people who are looking to learn and getting involved in those is a great way to get into mentoring. They have a structured way to sort of get you started, they'll have people around to help you learn as well, they will have uh, all the resources that you need in order to get started and this is just a list of a few organizations that would benefit from your time and expertise. So, this is just a few. There are very many. There really is no excuse not to get involved. And if you don't want to go to a meetup, then maybe you work with a junior colleague or a non-technical colleague who's interested in learning development. A mentoring doesn't have to be one-on-one. -on -one. You could maybe run a lunch and learn, or run a workshop, or maybe start mob programming. These are all valid ways of teaching. So once you've got a mentee or mentees, let's talk about what makes a good mentor. I'd like to think that these rules work well for mentoring, but also for any kind of professional relationship, especially senior to junior or managers with your team. Start by setting expectations. How much time are each of you able to give? What do you expect each other to provide? Answer questions that they might have about mentoring and try and set their mind at ease. Asking for a mentor can be very difficult, so quelling any anxieties around that is really important at the start. If you want, one of the things I quite like to do is write each other's roles and responsibilities down, kind of like a job description. That way you both know what you're entering into. Find out what they need from you, what areas you can help them with, and what they're looking to improve on. Everyone is going to need something different, so try not to treat all of your mentees the same. Find out what they're hoping to achieve and what outcomes they're aiming for. Listen to them and care about what matters to them. Find out how they want to learn, what makes them comfortable and uncomfortable, and then you can prioritize what it is that you're going to work on. And of course, don't forget to celebrate their achievements. That way you're building up your mentee's confidence, reinforcing good behavior, and keeping them focused and motivated. Mentees often need approval from their mentors, and acknowledging their success is a good way to satisfy that psychological need for recognition. Work out how regularly you'll be able to meet and when those meetings are going to occur. Do they prefer face-to-face, -face, video, or chat? Do they enjoy pairing? Do they prefer small problems or big projects? Be very clear with yourself about your own time constraints too, as well as with your student. You can't pass on useful information if you're burnt out. Set a realistic schedule that you'll both be able to stick to. Have regular honest reviews about how well both of you are doing with achieving the goals that you've set, and track progress and change your schedule if necessary. When you're mentoring someone, you might feel pressured to give them advice straight away. But don't be afraid to leave space for your mentees to talk. 
silence sometimes feels uncomfortable, especially to us British people. <laughs> And it's sometimes essential to finding out what your mentee wants or needs. You need to leave space for them to talk. And I'm sure you all possess all kinds of accumulated wisdom, but your mentee isn't an empty vessel into which you can pour your knowledge. It's unfair to them if you drone on and on, taken with your own brilliance. Listen to what your mentee has to say before giving your opinion. Find out their point of view. They bring insights and perspectives that you may not yet appreciate. Set up a method for getting regular feedback from them on how they think they're progressing and how you're doing as a mentor. And remember that feedback isn't criticism. If someone gives you feedback, don't take it as a negative or as something that you've missed. Take it as their belief that you'll make a difference, that you can do something and make a positive change. People also need to know what they did well. They need concrete, constructive feedback and critical feedback too sometimes, but never generic feedback. Make sure your feedback is to the point and useful. It's easy to get suckered into stereotypes or blinkered by our own perspectives when we're teaching, but great mentors recognize that it's their responsibility to break through common assumptions by asking questions and digging deeper. This is especially true if you're mentoring someone who's in the early stages of their career, or the two of you are just getting to know each other, and maybe they haven't decided how transparent they can be with you yet. Some students might be ashamed to ask questions, or to ask you to clarify, or to slow down. So for example, if you're mentoring someone who's having trouble talking to their manager, instead of instantly launching into a story about a time that you had communication issues with your manager, Spend time asking questions that draw out the important details of the problem. Don't make assumptions simply based on conversations that you've had with them previously, because they probably work and communicate differently with you than they do with their manager. The other thing that you can do to enable your students is to keep them in mind at every opportunity that you can. So when you hear about job opportunities, mention them. Speak up for them whenever you can. If you see them at a networking event, introduce them to people. If you've got a good personal network or social standing, use that to get them a stronger foothold in the industry. Attend events with them, attend meetups with them. This idea, of, uh, this idea is called sponsorship, and it can take very minimal effort on the mentor's part but make a huge difference to the mentee's prospects. The mentees that I've worked with are an absolute inspiration. Many of them are learning while holding down jobs, or are still in education, or supporting families, and they bring a positivity to their studies that is absolutely infectious. They're eager to learn and try new things, and we could all do with a little more positivity and excitement, especially when encouraging junior developers. My students have taught me that there's so much to gain from trying new things and very little to lose. Their passion for constant improvement helps to drown out the voice of imposter syndrome. Since I started teaching, I've given talks, I've run events, I've written blog posts, none of which I would have done before for fear of failing and for fear of even getting started. There's a Hebrew word called fergun, which describes genuine delight or pride in the accomplishments of another person. And that is the best description that I've been able to find for the joy that mentoring can bring. So hopefully today will not only give you new skills and excitement for great tech, but also a desire to share that new knowledge with others and make our industry the best it can be. Thank you. <laughs>